Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Sorry that this took slightly longer than expected. Uh, Judge Wood seems to have somewhat of a harrowing trip to get here, but we very, very much appreciate your being here. I'm going to give a quick introduction, if you don't mind. Um, so Judge Wood uh, started her career by being one of the first women Supreme Court clerks in US history, clerking for Judge Blackman. Uh, after brief stints with the State Department, Covington, Burling, and Georgetown University, George Wood began a career at University of Chicago School of Law, where she was the third woman ever on the faculty at the law school, uh, and the first woman to have a named chair position at the, at the university. Um, she, in fact, still teaches there to this day. Um, between 1993 and 95, she served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General for International Appellate and Policy. International Appellate and Policy in the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice. Um, after that, she was nominated by Bill Clinton to the Seventh Circuit, where uh, she is currently the Chief Judge. Um, since being nominated in 1995, Judge Wood has gained the reputation of being uh, one of the most respected jurists in the entire United States, and so it's a great honor to have her here today. Thank you so much. Many thanks to David, many thanks uh, to all of you, oops, uh, for your patience in, th this was, um, a, as, as he said, a bit, a bit more harrowing uh, of a trip than I had expected because, I mean, may maybe some of you in the room are, are good with physics, uh, so, so here's your challenge. If you're driving at 50 miles an hour on a highway and something <coughs> explodes the back driver's side window of your car, how close were you to it have exploded you? Uh, <laughs> and the answer is really close. Uh, and that's what happened to me this morning. My car is sitting there at O'Hare Airport with glass all over it with uh, no, I mean, of course it's not locked because there's no window uh, there. So I'm hoping that everything will be all right and I, with apologies, am going to slip away and go back to LaGuardia, what fun, um, <laughs> this afternoon. So I came here to share with you some thoughts about class actions, about aggregate litigation that I've had over the years, and, and I meant for it to be uh, a, a more informal conversation. Um, the problems only multiply, it seems to me, over the years. And it's not just a small claims problem, it's not just a big claims problem, but I think the sources are a bit different depending what you're talking about. You know, on the small claims side, I'm sure you're all familiar, all sorts of things happen to people that are super annoying and maybe they happen to large numbers of people. Maybe somebody who manufactured a coffee pot put a dysfunctional timer in it so you can't set it to make your coffee at your preferred time in the morning. Maybe you rented a car that had charges on it that shouldn't be there. Or maybe you purchased software that promised to clean up all the problems with your computer and make it faster. And actually what it did was inserted problems into your computer and then you had to buy more software to fix. Uh, th these are all cases I've seen, by the way. Um, more software to fix it. Well, no one is going to bring that lawsuit individually. Today it costs $400 to file a civil lawsuit in a federal district court. And so most people, you would think, on their own are not going to pay $400 to solve a $75 problem, if it's even that much. Um, and they certainly, of course, the filing fee is just the beginning of, of the expenses of litigating. So, you know, of course, that problem needs solving. State courts are actually not a great answer either for these very small claims uh, situations, although I'm gonna confine my comments for the most part to federal court since obviously that's what I know better. Um, with large claims, we have a whole different set of issues. It's not that the economics of bringing an individual lawsuit don't make sense. Many times with large claims, uh, they could be made to pay but you still have left the specter of inconsistent rules around the country. You have the tremendous expense of building up a case with the proper expert testimony, with the proper uh, research. Uh, and I will tell you, 
slight detour and interesting anecdote. This happened many years ago. It was probably in the late 90s. Um, I was invited to go um, give an address at a conference that the Cour de Cassation, the Civil Supreme Court in France, actually they have cr criminal jurisdiction too, but it's civil in the sense of not administrative, not constitutional, uh, was having about comparisons between common law and civil law, because as you know, the French have the Napoleonic Code, the civil law system. And my particular topic, they called, roughly translated, literally translated, they called third party interveners. But when I got to Paris, I discovered, uh, like at the cocktail party the night before, that they meant class actions. They wanted a discussion of what class actions were. Uh, so I went back and stretched my French to the limit and fixed what I was going to say and changed it to a talk about class actions on, on a dime. But then afterwards, I asked the, the president of the court, why are the French interested in class actions? You know, this isn't part of your legal system. And remember, this is the late 90s. There's been some development in the years since about the way aggregate litigation devices are used in those kinds of countries. But he said, something that any of you could have said. He said, look, you know, we don't want to keep trying the same lawsuit over and over again throughout the country. We know that there are these devices that have developed in the United States, that for that matter have developed in Quebec, they have developed here and there, and so they were very interested in, in engaging with, with the idea of how should you handle this. For many of these efficiency reasons, legal consistency reasons, that I think apply whether you're talking about a small case or a large case. So obviously we have for a long time, in some sense since 1938, but certainly since 1966, had the class action device. And, and it's a little nostalgic to read the comments of the advisory committee uh, to the 1966 amendments to Rule 23 because they thought they had really hit on the answer to the small claims problem. They write, you know, well, big cases might not be suitable for treatment under Rule 23b3, but, you know, the small claims, uh, claims in which the individual class members have little interest in personal control of the process, and then this is what they said, I'm quoting, the amounts at stake for individuals are so small that separate suits would be impractical, and they thought this was B3. This, this was what it was for. Uh, they were not quite so much thinking about large claims, but in some ways, I'm gonna take a piece of my antitrust background. I still love antitrust law. We don't get enough cases in the Seventh Circuit, but a um, little bit of that. As of 1966, a great number of markets, most markets in the United States were what I would call relatively unconcentrated. Now, there's quite a bit of literature that has been coming out recently in the field of market structure, um, antitrust, whatever you want to say, um, that is pointing out that there has been, since the 1980s, this is a, a long-term trend, a trend toward far greater concentration in markets. Well, what does that mean for, for, for any of us? It means maybe instead of having, you know, 50 relatively equal sized pharmaceutical companies, you only have three or four or five. Maybe it means in other sectors, the automobile sector, you have far less diversity of sources. And that means something too for dispute resolution. You know, maybe if there's only one defendant or a couple of defendants and it's a market-wide phenomenon, there's some good reason for case consolidation. So certainly the nature of litigation has changed with the characteristics of the markets that we're dealing with. I will say parenthetically, what one of those, um, a fair amount of this new literature in the antitrust area is suggesting that maybe we need to start looking at whether um, our markets have become too concentrated and whether we need to take, let's say, a more aggressive look at merger control, et cetera. But that's a talk for another day. So anyway, we are at the moment, though, struggling to find the best way to solve these problems. And I'm gonna offer you a few observations. First of all, 
what I was thinking of calling a death by a thousand cuts. You know, Rule 23 is not the Supreme Court's favorite rule these days, I don't think. They have been very strict about it, maybe for good reason. You know, you want to think about why they, they may, may have done that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and talk about the way that uh, class act, you know, the kinds of challenges that class actions are facing, and then suggest a few things that we might do about it. So right off the bat, it became pretty clear that class actions were not just a matter of strolling into court and say, ah, I've identified a problem, I'm going to be the named representative. Remember the very early case of Eisen against Carlisle and Jacqueline, you know, it's expensive to give people notice. And even today, the courts are a little stodgy uh, about notice. You know, they like letters to be mailed to people, even if it's a Yahoo case, you know, where nobody has even seen a letter maybe in their life. You know, they, they live on, on, on the internet. Uh, there are expenses. There are agency problems that people quickly pointed out. And I can tell you from where I sit, I have seen more than a few class action settlements that are very suspect. And there you know, are some people who make it their business in life to attack class action settlements for being too one-sided toward the lawyer and delivering insufficient or insufficiently effective relief to the class members. This is real. This, this happens, and our court has disapproved uh, some number of those settlements and sent it back to the district court to say you've got to tell the parties to try again. You know, we, we are not going to say that this is the kind of representation of the unnamed class members that they are entitled to under the provisions of the rule. So these agency problems were identified relatively early after the 1966 amendments. And I won't say that anymore. I'm, I'm assuming that that's what we're talking about. Um, but they, that's still the focus of a lot of the tweaks that you see. Rule 23 has been reworked and reworked, and people keep studying it. The Standing Committee on Rules of Practice and Procedure, which is the Judicial Conference Committee that has responsibility for virtually all rules in federal courts, and on which I sat for six years, uh, you know, has had a subcommittee on class actions for a while, chaired by the very able uh, district court judge Robert Dow, who happens to be in Chicago. Uh, and, and so all these reforms, you know, making sure the judge is looking at who's going to be the lawyer, making sure that the class members get notice, making sure that there's a double opt-out, these are all designed in one way or the other to address the agency problems. And we still not, may not be finished. On a more theoretical level, there are people who are challenging the legitimacy of the entire opt-out model. Uh, that's not the model that's used, for example, in the Fair Labor Standards Act, where you have an opt-in collective action as opposed to an opt-out. Uh, and in the real world, I don't know how many of you have gotten these notices, you know, in, in delivered somehow, I'll just say in the mail, meaning any kind of communication, where, you know, you may be a member of this class, and, you know, I throw them away, actually. I don't look at them, and then I never participate in whatever the relief is either. Um, so I'm afraid it might compromise me, actually. But, um, but anyway, the opt-out model uh, deserves some serious consideration as to its legitimacy. I promised you in the title a little bit about court capabilities. Um, in many of these cases, especially when you get to the um, question under 23b3, whether a class action is going to be a superior way of handling whatever the problem is. You get to the question quite quickly of judicial capabilities. You know, and here there's a very interesting contrast between the way the United States handles things, again, and the way many other countries do. So when I was doing the antitrust work, um, I kept trying to explain to the Europeans, you can't do anything in the United States until you go to a federal district court. Uh, you don't have, even in the Federal Trade Commission, you don't have the ability, normally speaking, to just announce this is the rule. You have to stop this merger or you have to stop this anti-competitive practice. The FTC needs to go to a federal court to stop the merger. 
Whereas in the, in the administrative structures, I think it's why the European Commission is much more willing to impose conditions on mergers, because they've got the bureaucratic apparatus to monitor those conditions, to decide whether the parties are in the spirit of whatever it was, implementing those conditions. All you have in the United States is a federal judge. Now, some people in this room, most people in this room, I'm gonna say maybe there are a few exceptions other than myself, uh, are probably too young to remember when Harold Green, the district of DDC, uh, the district court for the District of Columbia, was running the country's telecommunications system. But this, uh, you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. In, there was an antitrust case brought um, against AT&T for monopolizing, and it was resolved by what came to be known as the Modified Final Judgment, the MFJ. It was a consent decree, essentially. It was resolved in 1982, and who monitors consent decrees? A federal <coughs> district court judge monitors federal court consent decrees. Maybe he'll appoint you know, somebody as a master to report to him in the monitoring of that decree, but it's up to the judge to monitor the decree. So between 1982 in 1996, when Congress finally passed uh, a statute that reflected these changes, um, even that looks pretty clunky now if you look back at it, but at the time, it, w it brought um, the legal regulation of the telecom business up to modern standards. It was Judge Green who was deciding, you know, could Ameritech offer this new service or that enhanced service or was somebody else entitled to enter a market? And that is a strain on a federal district court judge's resources. The courts, I can promise you, do not have budgets that allow them to go out and hire uh, an expert staff to see if, to take the telecoms example, people are providing access as they should. If it's a pharmaceutical uh, company, there's real expertise you have to have in order to know what's the company doing? You know, are they in fact um, complying with whatever it is the court asked them to do? So, so it's, a, it's a poor fit. And it's actually even a poor fit for the way that judges are trained because of course judges are trained the way all of you are trained. You're in your law school and you know, this is the case A who sued B. Well, obviously modern complex litigation doesn't look anything like that. So the management of the case, the supervision of whatever comes out of it, which is, I want to say, 99.9999 times an agreed settlement. Class actions don't normally go to trial. In fact, nothing normally goes to trial. The most recent statistics from the administrative office of the US courts indicate that something on the order of 1.7% of the cases filed in federal district courts are resolved by a trial. All the rest of them are resolved otherwise. Obviously, 12B6 motions, summary judgment motions, settlements along the way where there'll be a Rule 41 motion, whatever, but 1.7%. So it's not just class actions, but the settlements in aggregate litigation of any kind, of course, are, are more complex. And they normally call for continuing jurisdiction in the court to make sure that uh, the spirit of the settlement and the, the letter of the settlement are being um, observed. So, um, it, and, and another thing that it does for the judge, which is a, I'm also gonna say a clumsy fit, is it really puts the judge in, in a role that is, it's not that the judge is taking sides one way or the other, but the judge is also not the umpire to which Chief Justice Roberts referred in his confirmation hearings. The judge, the decisions of the judge are gonna have a big impact on the way the case moves forward, whether it's you know just the appointment of who's the lead counsel going to be or, or anything else. So, so early on with class actions, a number of these problems came to, came to light. 
then the Supreme Court, I would say, always following the, or, or responding to this tension. You know, what are we doing with class actions? Are we just doing regular litigation, or are we doing some other thing? And they have tended to fall on the regular litigation side, which I think explains a number of the decisions that have not been particularly um, supportive of class treatment. So everybody thinks of the Walmart against Duke's case, an employment discrimination case. I remember looking at that case when it was on its way up to the Supreme Court, thinking the only question is how are they going to reverse the Ninth Circuit? It, you know, which, which ground are they going to pick? Uh, because the Ninth Circuit's decision is just not one that can survive. The court is never going to accept a multi-million person class uh, of people who are managers in every Walmart in the United States who are complaining about the promotion policies. Even if they were good complaints, I just didn't see the court doing it. And of course, they didn't. Uh, what they did is taking a page from um, some of the scholarship that's been done here and the late and wonderful and much missed Professor Richard Nagarita, they said we need to find a common problem by which we don't just mean some common question that you can articulate at a high level of generality. We don't just mean was Walmart discriminating on the basis of sex in its managerial selections, et cetera. What Professor Nagarita had said, it's, it's got to be a problem that is amenable to a single solution to. Can you, in one fell swoop, to borrow Shakespeare, uh, solve this problem? So it, it really cranked up the need to show real, what I'm calling deep commonality. And that raised a slew of cases in the wake of Walmart, which is a 2011 decision. It feels like it's been here a long time, but it's really it's just 2011. Uh, trying to say, well, what does that mean? Because almost all class actions, maybe it's a bad pharmaceutical, maybe it's pelvic mesh, maybe it's you know, an asbestos case. It's very common once the legal issues have been addressed uh, to get down to the stage of individualized relief. You know, the person who took the pill or the person who got the implant or the person who you know, suffered traumatic brain injury or the person, whatever. Everybody's going to be different. And it was never thought that that destroyed the possibility of a class action. It was a pretty well understood way that you handled it. You know, you'd get a, you know, a master or a magistrate judge or somebody, and there would be a claims facility, and people would submit claims, and there would be individualized decisions finally at that level. But the defense bar was quick to jump on this, and they were quick to say that is inconsistent with Walmart. Um, it, it, it seems like as though what they were arguing for was a regime under which there are no class actions unless that last stage is practically formulaic. Now, if it is just formulaic, I think even they would agree, fine, uh, that, that counts. But, no one has gone that far. The Supreme Court has never gone that far. We still see something like the normal structure. But the upfront burden of showing commonality was certainly enhanced by Walmart. Um, another thing uh, I think that I will highlight as a, as a problem that's really bubbling to the surface now more than ever, it's really happened in the wake of the passage of the Class Action Fairness Act um, because many of the class actions captured by the Class Action Fairness Act rely on state law as the basis of the claim. And in fact, many of, many of your cases probably do too. An awful lot of state law, an awful lot of tort law is still state law. Um, but which state law? Well, I know in the Seventh Circuit we have rejected class actions because they encompassed too many different state laws. And it wasn't easy, once again, to see that manageability uh, if you're looking at all sorts of different state laws. One of, you'll remember the Bridgestone-Firestone cases where the tires were exploding and people were being killed 
when the um, trucks went off the road and they were consolidated for multi-district litigation purposes in the Southern District of Indiana. And at some point along the way, there was an appeal to our court. And we said, you know, are we can have 50 subclasses. You know, what, what are we gonna do? And actually we would need more than 50 subclasses because some of those cases um, involved people from other countries. There were um, people from a number of different countries who were also subject to that. So, the choice of law problem is, is something that's also making it more difficult to sustain uh, class actions. And, I mean, I could go on. One fairly new thing that I've been seeing is the result of the Supreme Court's uh, relatively recent decision, I think just a year and a half ago, in the Bristol Myers Squibb case in California. So that case, you would say, well, what does that have to do with class actions? But I'd say, aye, there's the rub. Um, that case began, and actually always was, it was in state court under a California law that permits coordinated actions. So it's much more like just a lot of joinder. Uh, it's not a class action. There's no class certification. But there were about 600 plaintiffs. And here's where the intersection of another line that the Supreme Court is developing is proving to be important, it could be important in any case that you're thinking about. So you'll remember that the Supreme Court has now for some time adopted what actually started and what I think of as the most uh, successful academic article ever, uh, Von Maron Troutman article suggesting that personal jurisdiction should be understood as two types of jurisdiction, general jurisdiction where you're at home, place of incorporation, principal place of business largely, and specific jurisdiction when the case arises out of the things you did in that state. So the classic case for specific jurisdiction was you're in a car accident in that state, there's a tort action, you know, maybe you're an out-of-stater, so there's diversity jurisdiction, but that's fine. That state is a sensible place to bring that action for the, for the tort. Uh, Worldwide Volkswagen says not so much if it's, if it's a product liability case, but for the tort, that state is sensible. How do you expand that? Well, what the Supreme Court says in Bristol-Meyer is that of the approximately 600 people who were suing Bristol Meyer in California, I think it was about 180 or so, don't hold me to these exact numbers, but that was the ratio, about 180 or so were California citizens who had brought um, their case, their part of the case involved purchases that they made in California. But, some, but many, but the, all the rest of them the balance of, of the group, I'll just call it, were not Californians, and their purchases from Bristol Myers were not made in California. So the question was, does this device of the California mass action allow those out-of-state people to piggyback on the California people and, and pursue their case in this the word in the California statute is coordinated way. Um, and what the Supreme Court says is no. We said in Walden against Fiore, we said, in, we've said in all sorts of cases, site, 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 uh, Nicastro, another one, uh, we've said that specific jurisdiction exists only, at, first of all, has to be determined claim by claim. And secondly, it exists only if you are suing the defendant for the defendant's forum-related activities. And these non-California plaintiffs, even though they were in this coordinated proceeding, were not suing out of the defendant, Bristol Myers Squibb's, California activities. The court was unimpressed by the argument that the burden on Bristol Myers wasn't particularly huge because they already had to defend something against 180 people in California. But the court says this is a rigid rule, it's a due process rule, you can't do it. So the next logical question is, well, does that rule also apply to class actions? And so it's on the one hand, on the other hand, and the district courts are split about this. Some district courts are saying, 
Uh, yes, it should apply to class actions because specific jurisdiction is specific jurisdiction, and if the unnamed members of the class don't happen to be uh, people who had forum-related contacts with the defendant, then by the same logic as we saw in Bristol-Myers, you can't do that. <coughs> That's the rule. That means that there'll be only two places where you can bring a nationwide class action. Delaware, you know, or maybe North Dakota, the place of incorporation, place number one, or wherever the company happens to have its principal place of business. Now, that's going to put, make the Delaware courts very busy if that's the rule, because everybody understands that that was not the rule before the Bristol-Myers case. So, so this question is, what's the impact of Bristol-Myers? So one group of district courts are saying, yeah, but that, if that's what due process requires, that's what due process requires. The other district courts are saying, wait a minute, class actions are different from just mechanisms to coordinate the litigation of whatever, 600 different plaintiffs, just as we think MDLs are different. Um, they have some characteristics in common, coordinated pretrial management, but in the end, they're different. And so these other district courts are saying, once you've jumped through all the hoops of Rule 23, all four parts of 23A, also you pick your part, let's just assume it's B3, uh, and you have this litigating entity called the class, it's unimaginable to think that you need to get every unnamed member of the class who didn't opt out separately to serve process on the defendant and separately to establish the minimum contacts. So all I can say is stay tuned. This, this is brewing. It is a, a, a very interesting question, and it's going to have a very serious impact, however it ultimately gets resolved. Maybe the court will decide to look at it at some point as it goes through uh, the various courts of appeals. Um, so, so that's an interesting and, and cutting edge thing. Um, I guess what I'll do at this point, since I have to race back to, oh, to not O'Hare, to, to LaGuardia, um, to fix my car, um, is, is I'll conclude by saying that we desperately need new thinking on these coordination mechanisms. Our new thinking needs to take into account the administrative capabilities of the court. Our new thinking, I think, needs to it, we, may, we may be speaking legislatively here, needs to understand that the court is looking for new models that it regards as legitimate for the way groups are formed. In Europe, they like preformed groups, and we certainly have a concept of organizational standing and the right of organizations, whether they're a union or whether it's uh, a case I had recently where Common Cause and the League of Women Voters were suing uh, various entities in Indiana for voter registration issues, uh, but the organizations were allowed to assert their own interests. So organizational uh, ability to sue, when you feel very comfortable that all of the people before the court want to be there, and maybe organizational approaches would solve some of these personal jurisdiction issues, I, I don't know. Um, but there is a, a great deal of work that needs to be done, and I think it's, it is being done, as the most recent example I can think of, Taylor against Sturgill in the U.S. Supreme Court said, um, the court is very committed to the idea that each individual person, each entity, is entitled to his, her, or its own day in court. And that is a challenge for anyone who's trying to come up with efficient group decision making. So I'll leave it at that. I think maybe I could take a question or two if, if you have any, but um, sorry, I feel like sorry to eat and run. <laughs> I mean, but, um, anyway, it's a fascinating area. I'm sure that you're up to it. Are there any questions for the judge? No? You got one? <laughs> no. I just came around and said, hello, Diane. Hi, Richard. <laughs> Seeing you again.